Okay, so I have the audio recording. I want to make sure it doesn't stop when I switch apps because it keeps happening to me. There we go. Okay, I think we're moving. Alrighty. How are you? How? That was weird. I was trying to mix two different sentences together. How are you all? I didn't scare you all last week who were showing to the class now, so I guess I must have done something right, or what I'm saying is so outlandish, you just want to watch me crash and burn. So, <laughs> um, I did want to address a couple of things mentioned last week, because I feel like I could have gotten more in depth, but I wanted to try to get through the bulk. Um, as far as ethical issues in scripture, I want to double check, so what I did this week is I did a bunch of research again um, to make sure I'm correct, but yes, when it comes to a lot of the wars in the Old Testament, um, fun fact, actually, like in the Talmud and other areas, it, it's notified that like Joshua and his uh, conquest would have uh, given out three letters to the tribes, warning them to basically get their act together or, and leave or they're going to wipe them out. Um, so there's a lot of, one of the things I want to mention, because uh, Brandon, you asked such a great question last week, which is why isn't this in the text, right? Why are these things not in the text? One of the things I think that, and this is just uh, is something that happens with Protestant denominations in general, um, and and I know some people are like, we're not Protestant. Mm, yeah, we are. Um, so, like, just by definition, by where we broke off, we're considered Protestant. One of the things is that came from that is what we call sola scriptura, which is like scripture alone. Problem is that some people take that to such an extreme where they forgot that scripture does not necessarily exist within a vacuum right? It's a historical text. It is scripture. It's God breathed, of course, but it doesn't exist within a vacuum, which means that there's more historical context. And so for them who lived during that time, this all makes sense because they have their context. Like when I read the constitution or the declaration of independence, I understand the context. I don't need somebody explaining to me with this and this and this and that throughout the whole thing because I understand it. So for them, it's the same thing. So for us, I think it's important that we understand that as we're diving into scripture, um, on some of these issues, that doesn't exist within a vacuum. We do have other historical texts and uh, archaeology that point to other things that help confirm the Bible and bring more clarity to it. Um, so with Jewish sources, I mean, there's anything from the, from the Mishnah to the Midrash to the Talmud to all these different other extra biblical texts that help clarify some things within the text. Um, also, we have uh, like Babylonian sources. We have um, even some uh, Egyptian archaeology, things like that to help confirm things and bring more clarity. So when we're dealing with things like what we talked about last week, ethical issues in scripture, uh, like wars and stuff, you'll notice that the things, the one people group that God consistently was like, no, these need to be dealt with were those who are of the giant clans. Um, the giants, uh, as you mentioned, like, of course, we all are familiar with the story of Goliath. Um, and that is because of some things in Genesis chapter six. Um, I do not agree with what a lot of Christians have done with that text. Um, I do believe that the Nephilim, like the sons of God who came down, I actually do believe that they were supernatural beings. Um, and I think that's how the Jews have always interpreted that as well. So I think we have tried to like, before I jump into what we're going to talk about, i just want to address some, like I said, some of those things. I think sometimes we as Christians are almost scared to get into the supernatural view of the Bible. So sometimes we get a little, we get a little freaked out by it. So um, I think we should just let the text be the text. And then also we should, uh, when the text seems like it's saying something that's pretty bad, maybe we should dig in there a little bit further because you might find more clarification, right? So uh, when it deals with a lot of the holy words and stuff, you'll actually notice that another thing that Israel did is that you were allowed to become Israel. So if I'm kicking you from the land, you could proselytize in, um, into Israel. You could become a Jew. Um, in fact, that's why the Bible, if you go through the Old Testament or, or the Tanakh, which is the Old Testament, mm -hmm. you'll n hear mention of the people who lived like on the outside of the camp. There are different people groups, but they're considered part of them. And that's because that it was, they are becoming one of us. Uh, and they actually have a whole process on how one became officially a Jew. So there's some things here that I just, we will get into as we go through this series. But I just want you guys to have some things primed in your head or other things to so maybe you go research yourself if you want right now, whatever. But this is why I said last week some of those sources are really important. Um, is God a moral monster? Did God really uh, command genocide? And I'll add the book that uh, I'm reading that you just started, Micah, which is uh, the which is The Unseen Realm by Dr. Michael Heiser. All these ones are really good because they help build context around 
that because, guys, we are thousands of years removed from a culture that's in the Middle East. So we're talking ancient Middle Eastern culture, very different than 21st century Western culture, okay? So sometimes we read things very literally into the text because we Westerners are very literal. Uh, they're not. So when they would say, they would make generalizations, like sometimes they'd be like, and there was no rest day or night. Does that literally mean that nobody rested day or night? No, they're saying it was very strong, very powerful. There's a lot, right? So sometimes we have to just make sure we're not trying to pick apart idioms, if you will. But that's not the point of today's lesson. That was free of charge. Today, we're dealing with canonicity. How do we know which books of the Bible are the right ones? Now, next week, I am preaching here, so y'all know to skip. Uh, but then the other thing is, is uh, my friend Brian, uh, my best friend Brian, he's co-host with me on the Church Split podcast. Um, he's going to come in next week, and he's going to thoroughly go through this topic. So I'm going to set it up for him today, and then next week, he's going to bring the bring, bring the rain, okay? And the reason why I'm having Brian do this is because he's taught it before because of something he obsessed over, uh, and he's very good at having a presentation for this. So Brian's going to deal with this more in depth next week. Um, and I think that's important because fun fact, many of you guys already know I come from a very Baptist background. Brian comes from a very reformed background. Um, so Brian, I mean, he literally graduated from Kelvin college. He went to Kelvin church and he also, his grandpa was the first person to take all of John Kelvin's works and put it to one Latin volume. So in other words, he came from a very Calvinist and Reformed background. And so with that being said, he became obsessed with what happened during the Reformation and how were certain books picked out because Martin Luther, for example, wanted to get rid of the book of James. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I love the book of James, so I'd be mildly offended. But uh, that's just important. So that's something that Brian is really passionate about. He's great. He's fantastic. You guys will love him, all right? So, but I'm going to set him up today. So I'm, we're, today we are dealing with canonicity of scripture. Uh, how do we know which books of the Bible are the right ones? Now, when I say canonicity, I'm talking about the scriptural canon, okay? So I am not talking about this canon, all right? When I talk about the scriptural canon, people are like, oh, so we like shoot Bibles at people? That sounds awesome. <laughs> it's a whole new holy warfare, all right? So I'm not talking about a canon. I'm talking about canon. So for those of you who... how. This is, of course, the cultural divide. How many of you guys are Marvel fans? How many of you are DC fans? No, get out of here. What? They're both good. The movies are horrible, but the DC comics are awesome. Fight me, Micah. I will. Little hobbit back there. What are you going to do? Jump up, punch me in the kneecap? Get out of here. All right. So, but, so in, in the world of comic books, see, you guys didn't know that comic books and nerdness would apply to theology, did you? Canon? Yeah, so the, what this is, is that, so, in the comic books, you have a storyline that we call canon. This is the official storyline, right? So, Spider-Man, you know, his Uncle Ben died, he lived with Aunt May, and he becomes Spider-Man, he goes to college. This is what we call the canon. It's his official story. But then, this other series that you might see on Disney right now is called What If, and it's instead, what if, instead of... Captain Steve Rogers becoming Captain America, what if he died and instead his, uh, Captain uh, Carter, be, Agent Carter became Captain America? Well, now it's a her, but that's not what they call the main canon. That's not the main story. It's a, it's a switch off, right? It's a play off of the main story, okay? So um, someone might say, uh, like for example, the original Spider-Man, he became Spider-Man in his like senior year of high school. But then there was this other comic book series that came out called the Ultimate Series, which made him a much younger when he first got his powers. But that's not what we call canon. It's not the main story. So when I'm dealing with the canon of scripture, I'm talking about how do we know what is the true story for what is scripture, okay? See how comic books apply? <laughs> so this, yeah, in the nerd world, they talk about this all the time. Yeah, yeah, but that's not canon. You know, this is the canon for that. You know, people played around with these characters, but this is the canon. Again, not the canon. <laughs> all right? So I just want to make sure we're clear on this. So uh, canonicity, the actual definition of canon in this sense, is a general law, rule, or principle by which something is judged. So we have a general rule and overall principle that we judge everything else, which is why in comic books we say that's not canon. Or we can say with scripture, with other books, 
that's not canon. Okay? So, a it's also what we would say a collection or a list of sacred books that are accepted as genuine. So, moving forward from that, if the Bible is inspired, then there is a line that must be drawn between the Word of God and other writings, correct? Because they must not simply be the same. So, now the question is, which books are the Bible, right? So, okay, so which books are there? So, let's talk about first the canonicity of the Old Testament, okay? So, we're going to talk about how we know these are the right texts, because there are other books that were written in the first, second, third century BC, right? Old books. How do we know which ones? There's also, I mean, you guys probably have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? The Dead Sea Scrolls has the Old Testament, but also has the War Scroll and the Book of Enoch, right? So which one is it? So do those, should those be included? Should they not? How do we get about it? So the Old Testament, also known as the Masoretic Text, many of you guys might realize that sounds similar to like Moses, the Masoretic Text. So, um, so regarding the Old Testament or the Masoretic Text, Christians recognize the same 24 books that rabbinical Judaism recognizes today. So in other words, we as Christians hold to the same books that the Jews hold to, okay, as far as the Old Testament. That is, so when we have gone through the tradition of the church, and by the way, tradition, have you ever noticed that tradition has a negative connotation now? You say tradition, and people go, ugh, tradition. And it's because we mix up the fact that there is, there is a good tradition and that there are just man's opinion traditions. But there's certain things that are, have been accepted since the beginning, such as the books of the Old Testament. These books here, um, you'll sometimes hear me refer to it as the Tanakh, which is what the Jews would call the Old Testament. Um, so the Tanakh, we recognize the same 24 books that rabbinical Judaism holds to today, the exact same ones. Uh, these are the same ones that have always been accepted throughout history. I'm talking, you could go back 6,000 years and they will always recognize the same books that we recognize. So that's important because we have a historical backing, right? Because it does us no good if, well, I mean, consider the, uh, the Mormons, right? Suddenly they got the Book of Mormon. And where does that have histor historicity? Well, they just say, well, it just takes precedence over the Bible. Well, now you're going against all the history of everyone who has ever held to Yahweh being the God of gods, right? So that's important. So the Mesoretic text is the same text used by Jesus as well and the apostles and all believers during that ministry. Have you guys ever considered the fact that, you know, we think of Paul and the New Testament and the gospels, those didn't come till later. Did you know what books they were, they were held to that they only had available to them? The Old Testament. So that's why you'll notice that throughout the Gospels, what are they quoting? The Old Testament. They're continually quoting it because they're showing how that points to Jesus. So, and by the way, that gets bananas when you start really looking at it because you're like, whoa, wait, so the book of Isaiah was written 700 years before Christ. Then you read Isaiah 53 and you're like, that was like a play-by-play -play of what happened to Jesus 700 years before the actual event. So it's pretty intense. When you start getting into biblical prophecy with the Old Testament, it gets, you'll get goosebumps. It's super cool. But um, so the Mesoretic text is the same text used by Jesus, all right, and the apostles. Also, um, many people might not know this. I was going to bring mine today and I totally forgot. There also exists a Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. Have you guys ever heard of the Septuagint? It is literally just the Old Testament translated into Greek, okay? So the Septuagint is abbreviated uh, with the Roman numeral LXX, which means 70, because it's asserted that 70 scholars put the Septuagint together. Later on, people disagree and say it was actually 72 because of six tribes from his, six people from each tribe of Israel. Whatever. Okay. The Septuagint exists. It's a translation of the Old Testament into the Greek. You'll notice also the disciples and Jesus quote the Septuagint quite a bit because the Septuagint was used in Egypt by Hellenized Jews. By Hellenized, this means that these were Jews who spoke Greek and lived in Greek culture, okay? Because as much as we think all Jews spoke Hebrew, they didn't. Actually, most likely Jesus spoke Aramaic, not necessarily Hebrew. So these are all important things to understand as we're going through understanding how the Bible was preserved. The Septuagint had other books in it as well, that are actually recognized by Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox Church. 
So the Septuagint had other books in it. Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox both include them. We do not. This is what we call the Apocrypha. Okay, these additional books are often called the apocryphal books or the deuterocanonical books. There's a word for you, deuterocanonical. <laughs> so the Apocrypha will do. <laughs> um, so the Apocrypha's writings, um, they're reports or writings that are not what we'd say considered genuine or canon. They don't measure up to the rest of scripture. So these books were written during the 400 years between the two Testaments, also known as the Dark Age or the Silent Period, okay? So I'm not sure if you know this, between your Old Testament and New Testament, there's about 400 years, okay? So these were written during that time. Now, Brian will get more into this next week, but this was a huge debate amongst the church. Do we include them? Do we not include them? Does anyone know why, can anyone guess why on the top of their head, why we would not include them? Some people say because they push works-based salvation. Um, some people say there's just like historical errors or it's not as accurate like in the book of Maccabees. So it can't be because it's not perfect, right? They're historical, but they're not inspired. They're not historical, not inspired. True. They're not by the prophets. I think the, right. That's actually a big one. So the prophets didn't write them. But I think one of the big ones is the Jews have never accepted them as part of their canon. Right. Even ancient Israel who had them. They consider them to be historical books that were not inspired. So I think actually the Apocrypha, I think we do a, a, a disservice as a church when we completely always say the Apocrypha books are horrible, don't ever read them. They're valuable. They create historical context, but they are not scripture because they've never been included in scripture. They are always just considered historical books like the book of Maccabees. Um, and it doesn't mean that there's not, yes, sir. Our, our old church Bible, um, one that used to sit up on the communion table thing, you know, has the apocryphal books in it. Oh, really? Yeah. That's so funny. One day I walk up there, you know, and I see the Bible laid open, and it's open to the Maccabees. <laughs> and that's up, on our, up on the front of our church. So, <laughs> like, yeah. We're Catholic now. Crazy. <laughs> so dunk the baby. Um. <laughs> that's right. We just got rid of the Bible. Yeah, that's what we just got. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, was it Esdras? Esdras has a really cool uh, uh, like um, proverb in it. But um, so anyway, there is some actually interesting stuff with the Apocrypha. But again, this is not considered scripture because it contradicts other parts of scripture. But they are historical books and they do help build a context for us to, for your question, Brandon, last week. They help build the context. What's the thought process? What's the world like during this time? What, who were these historical figures? What did they do? Things like that. They're valuable. So when we, when we, sometimes we can throw the baby out with the bathwater, um, and sometimes it's like, oh, maybe it is valuable. Maybe I should just, yeah, throw the baby out of the bathwater. That's my, that's my baby's crying in the back. Yikes. I'm not abusive, I swear. Um, so now these are the books that are included in the Apocrypha. First and second, Esdras, Tobit, Judith, Wisdom, Sirach, Baruch, Epistle of Jeremiah, Prayer of Manassas, Psalm 151. That's right. They have an, an additional psalm, which is actually really weird. I read that psalm and I was like, it's really not actually contradictory to anything. It's, it's fine. It's just not part of what they would consider the normals. For, for one through four Maccabees and additions to the book of Daniel and the book of Esther. Okay. So they add a little bit to some of those things. Now, Church history is really important. Um, it's not always the end all be all, but it is very important to understand uh, history. So in the earliest church history, the earliest list we have of what they considered to be the canon, and now keep in mind, this is just a list of one guy's collection of what they considered to be canon. It is not all of them, okay? It is not representative of everybody. This is just the earliest list we have, okay? The earliest list of the canon recognized by the church was recorded by Melito of Sardis, who flourished around 175 AD. So it's a couple hundred years, uh, not a couple hundred years, but 150-ish years after Jesus, right? So he records all books that Jews and Christians recognize. So all the ones that we recognize, all of us, except for the book of Esther. And he includes the book of wisdom in his list. The Wisdom of Solomon. I did quote that. You guys might remember when I talked about general revelation. Mm -hmm. So, I honestly, if we're going from a historical perspective, that's pretty good. Like, that's pretty solid, right? So, this gets even better. 
because as our master before us, Jesus Christ, we recognize the same books as Yeshua HaMashiach, which is Jesus Christ, so to say it in Hebrew, and the Jews before him. And we recognize the same books from the prophets of old that have been protected and preserved through the ages by a singular covenantal people. And the early church, the reason why they didn't necessarily hold to Esther, let's say, is because if you guys have ever read Esther, it's very much just like a historical story. So it's just a very... Have you ever read Esther? Yeah, we don't know who wrote it. It never mentions God either. Yeah, it's, yeah, it just kind of tells you the story, and you're like, wow, the faith of Esther, that's awesome. So a lot of the early church is like, well, this doesn't point to Jesus, so I guess we don't really need it. But Esther is actually important because we see actually quite a few other things in there. But uh, and like, for example, her husband being, I'm not sure you guys know this, Artaxerxes. Um, how many of you guys have, I'm not saying you should watch the movie, but just which sinners of you did watch the movie 300? Okay. All right. My sinners. All right. So the, the Xerxes, the Persian king with the world's largest recorded army of all time, who has taken over the entire known world, the Greeks versus Medes and Persians, that Xerxes was Esther's husband. So when you consider the fact that he's gone at war, you're like, oh, he's gone at war. It's like, no, no, he is the man. Who's taking over everything? He made Rome look pathetic. And um, that's her husband. This guy has no problem murdering people. And then you f f consider the fact that then she went before him. It gives you a whole other picture of what's going on a little bit when you understand. Again, scripture doesn't exist in a vacuum. So let's talk about the New Testament canon a little bit. So we recognize the same ones as Jews, right? As historically has always been the Jews. And we reject the Apocrypha, the Jews always did, because it just doesn't hold to the rest of Scripture. It's not written by a prophet. But it is historical and valuable, just not inspiration. Make sense? Cool. All right. So then the New Testament canon. Now this is where things get more complicated. Because we don't have the Jews who had the prophets to preserve it, Right? Um, so since th these were written after Christ, this does get more difficult since the, what we call the Gnostics and the Marcions all exploded over the ancient world. This creates even more complications. Now, who were these people? I can only summarize this because this would be a class in and of itself. The Gnostics were essentially people that believe that the physical world is evil. So the flesh, this world, all physical things, horrible, bad, evil, Satan. Okay. And then the Marcions, they believed that Jesus was not human at all, but a spirit. That he didn't come in bodily form. So he disagrees with the book of Hebrews and John 1. <laughs> so um, also the Marcions, that gets actually even more complicated because they also wanted to try to separate us as much from the Jews as possible. Um, and I don't think that's beneficial either. So, uh, so let's talk about the words of Christ for a second. Okay, the words of the master. John 14, 26 says this, but the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance of all the things I've said to you. John 15, 26 to 27, Jesus said, but when the counselor comes, whom shall I send you, uh, whom shall I send to you from the father, even the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father, he will bear witness to me. And you are also witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. John 16, 13 says, when the spirit of the truth of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will be declared to you the things that are to come. So Jesus promises that the spirit will give them an accurate remembrance of what Jesus has said to them and taught them. So this, these are the words of Christ. Hey, the spirit will come. So first off, when we're dealing with the New Testament canon, we have to understand that there is the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised it. Okay. Now, somebody can say that's presuppositional of me, but if you've been around here for a while, I've already given proofs of God's existence and we're about ready after missions conference because I think two weeks here, the missionaries will be speaking, right? So after missions conference, we're going to jump into a series talking about the historicity of the New Testament and how we know that it's reliable. Therefore, Jesus's words are reliable. Okay. So we're going to get to that point. But for now, this will do. Jesus says that the Spirit will come and bless us in this sense, that we will know what God says. Also, the rest of the New Testament was written by people who believed, taught, and wrote that the gospel was the very word of God, right? They said it continually. A good example is 1 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 13. Paul says, For you remember our labor and toil, brethren. We worked day and night and day that we might not burden any of you while we preach to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless we are, our, our behavior and 
whoa, was our behavior to you believers. So he talks about the importance here of the gospel being the word of God. Also, Galatians 1, 11 through 12, he says, for I would have you know, brethren, that the gospel was preached by me, uh, preached by me is not man's gospel, for I do not receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Here again, Paul says that this isn't man's gospel. This is a revelation from God, from Jesus Christ, and that is what he is proclaiming to us. And also 1 Corinthians 14, 36 through 37, Paul goes, what? Did the word of God originate with you or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that what I am writing to you is a command of the Lord. So this is him going, okay, that gospel is the word of God. Well, we have these books called the gospels for a reason. Okay. So he's acknowledging this is the word of God. Okay. Now, granted, the, the gospels themselves weren't written down until later. But that doesn't mean that they were that the stories of Jesus. Because you have to. This is the other issue that people have. They'll look at the old. Te I mean, they'll look at the New Testament and go, "Well, why wasn't it written right away? Why wasn't why was Mark not written until fifty or seventy five A.D.? Why wasn't it written right after Jesus ascended? And why did these other gospels take so long? You know, what's the big deal? Why? Why? How do we know someone didn't fabricate it? We forget the context. Who were the apostles? Well, they were Jews. What did the Jews have? This thing called the oral tradition. They were an oral culture, which means that they, why do you think that the gospels have so many of the same stories? And did you ever notice how Jesus worded things? So that it was easy to repeat. That's why they, uh, the Hebrews oftentimes speak in what we call parallelisms. They're paralleling different concepts. It was what we call poetry for them, but it's also to help us remember. You guys might remember that there were, there's this little verse that Paul says like, uh, talking about Jesus who died and rose again the third day according to the scriptures, right? If you actually break down the verse the way it's written in the Greek, it is written as one of those, as something that's easy to repeat. It's considered the first creed of the church, actually, because of the way it's written. So, point is, yeah, of course it took a little bit for these to be written. Because they were an oral tradition. These people traveled for three and a half years with Jesus, and they memorized his teachings, Makes sense. And then later on, it's like, well, he hasn't returned. Well, I guess we should probably write this down. <laughs> so, because <laughs> um, if you read, it sounds like the disciples thought he was coming. Like, very, very soon. Yeah. So, I think that's also something that we overlook. Now, the words of the apostles say this. So, what's even more remarkable is that when one realizes that it was believed during this time that there was no more revelation from God that the time of the prophets actually had ended. So by all intents and purposes, they shouldn't be considering things scripture because guess what? In 1 Maccabees 9, 27, here I go quoting these books. It says, there was a great distress in Israel such as had not ever been seen at the time that since the time that the prophets ceased to appear among them. This is in text, in a historical text, acknowledging the prophets have stopped. So when people are, now when you have Paul, who is an ardent, what? He was a Pharisee, wasn't he? Which means he was hardcore Jewish. I mean, this man was Jewish. There's a reason why he hated Christians. <laughs> when you have this man going, hold up, I'm proclaiming to you the word of God. That is huge coming from him. And that's actually one of the biggest proofs uh, is the life of Paul. And it throws like atheist historians to this day. Like, we don't understand this historical thing with Paul. Like, why would he switch? We're like, maybe because Jesus actually revealed himself. Occam's razor, right? The simplest answer. It's probably the right answer. Um, so the only thing that actually explains why a zealot would turn on his own cause, right? So anyway, Craig Keener says this. Josephus contends that there has been no exact succession of the prophets since the time of Artaxerxes, which is why no books have been accorded canonical authority since that time. So I think that's important too, because even Josephus, uh, a historian that we're going to talk about in the next few weeks, admits that mm, it just stopped happening. So with the current culture, no wonder why Christians were careful to ascribe such weight to the writings of their contemporaries. It took them a while to figure out which ones of these were going to be considered scripture. And you can see why, because you don't want to say that this is scripture when it's not. It's actually better to be more cautious than it is to be more liberal here, right? A conservative approach. So, 
Now that's the word. Now let's talk about a little bit more of the words of the apostles. So the proclamation of the gospel as the word of God broke the mold for the first century Judaism, which believed that this type of prophecy actually had ceased. So since the apostles believed that these were the words that came from the very weight of the word of God, this meant that they were putting themselves on par with Old Testament prophets. Then you wonder why they were getting beaten everywhere they were, right? Because they're saying, well, hold up. No, no, I've seen the risen Christ. This is the Messiah. We are declaring the word of God to you. So they're now saying, I'm on par with Isaiah, with Jeremiah, with all the prophets of old. Now you can see why it kind of shook some, rattled some cages a little bit. Um, this is why the epistles were so quickly to be accepted as scripture as well, because in like second Peter three, 15 through 16, Peter says this. So also our beloved brother, Paul wrote to you, according to the wisdom given him speaking of this, as he does in all his letters, there are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist their own, to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. Notice how Paul's letters were actually already being accepted by the church. Do you guys understand that? This is very early. It's already being accepted by the church, but also notice how it's already causing contention. <laughs> so now let's talk about the sub epistolic fathers for a second. So we talk about the apostles who are the fathers of the church, right there. These guys are the ones who saw the risen Christ, but there's this other group called the sub apostolic, um, sub epistolic fathers. These are the guys and many Christians don't know this, uh, that do you know, we have writings of people who are trained by the apostles. The Catholic Church likes to claim them, right? Well, we have the church fathers. It's like, man, the church fathers are everyone's church fathers. Y'all you know, don't get to claim all authority of them. Um, it's a little fun thing that they and the Eastern Orthodox like to do. <laughs> so, but mostly the Catholics. The Catholics like to do that because if you read, uh, I've been reading the church fathers recently. Um, if you read them, they talk about the, un the universal or the Catholic Church. They talk about the Catholic Church and the Holy Communion or, uh, and they, say, they use Catholic terms. But to them, Catholic meant universal, all of us. It didn't mean the organization of a Catholic church. Does that make sense? Again, context is important, historical context. So these are, were the men who wrote after the apostles. Some of these men heard the apostles preach, teach, and even were discipled by them. Men such as Clement, Ignatius, Polycarp, Hermas, Barnabas, Papias, etc. So these men were careful to create a distinction between their writings and the writings of the New Testament as well. So they were very careful to be like, whoa, whoa, I'm not Paul. I'm not writing scripture. I'm writing you my thoughts. So they're very careful at making sure that theirs was, was distinct, which is important because it means that they recognize it as scripture. So for example, Ignatius, who is one of the very earliest of the sub apostolic fathers, much earlier than the canon of scripture being established, already spoke of a collection of writings, which he called the gospels and the apostles which probably means he had a couple of the Peters in there. He probably had a couple of the Johns in there. He had the gospel writings. Okay. He might not have had Hebrews or something like that. Well, we have to bear in mind that how much the new Testament was not written by the 12. Right. Right. You have like three books, right? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Well, then you have the John, the epistles of John too, but, um, and Peter, but you pretty much have the three gospels. Those are your main ones. Yeah. Um, so these men were careful to create distinctions. So Ignatius wrote about that. And I think it's important that we um, are clear. So in the New Testament canon, now let's finally kind of land the plane. Let's start landing the plane a little bit. So since the beginning, the Gospels and the book of Acts were never doubted by anyone as authorities of Scripture. So it is not that the church... Uh, one day declared that these to be authority, right? So it's not like one day we arbitrarily said, these are it. No, they were recognized since the beginning. Rather, these writings imposed themselves on the church. They were never doubted as the correct record of Jesus Christ and his teachings. Because of how their accuracy, because of the way they reflected the reality, because of the way they taught about Jesus Christ and the wit eyewitnesses, it imposed itself on the church. That, and that's the way we should know scripture works, right? It imposes itself onto the believer. So um, it is not that uh, the church one day declared them arbitrarily. Yep. Okay, moving forward. So in fact, those who doubted the canonicity of some old books accepted the four gospels, Acts, 13 letters of Paul, 1 John, and 1 Peter. These scriptures alone are enough to establish most of Christian doctrines that we have today. That's the fun fact. So even when you go in, they're like, well, they only accepted these books cool. All my doctrines are still intact. We can remove the other ones and my doctrines are still intact and my belief in a risen Christ is still intact. Mm -hmm. So 
keeping the main thing the main thing, as I've mentioned in this class. Because again, I'm, I'm creating this as an apologetic, not necessarily as the doctrine class, right? So in the Eastern part of the Roman Empire, so this is, this is interesting, I thought. So in the Eastern part of the Roman Empire, some doubted the authenticity of the book of Revelation, also known as the Apocalypse of John. But in the Western part of the empire, some doubted the authenticity of the book of Hebrews. These were the only books that were doubted, but otherwise the rest were universally accepted. Mm -hmm. And somebody can read the book of Revelation and definitely go, I don't know. I think he's just high on mushrooms or something. Like, that's cool. What do you mean there's a seven horned dragon coming out of the sea? This is confusing. So, I can see why some people would be like, mm, you know, let's just not accept that. <laughs> um, of course, there's actually a lot to the book of Revelation. That's like a whole three year class in and of itself. But anyway, so in the Western part of the empire, some doubted the authenticity of Hebrews. But of course, if there's a large Jewish presence, some people would have a hard time accepting some of the things in Hebrews, right? That's the whole point. Hebrews was an apologetics book mm -hmm. to Jews about Jesus Christ. So people miss that a lot of times as well. So uh, then there is an Italian scholar, uh, and I'm going to try to not butcher this, Lu uh, Ludovico Antonio Muratori. Found, he found a list of canonical books from 175 AD, and they became known as what we call the Muratorian Canon. This list, which is the four Gospels, Acts, 13 Pauline letters, Jude, 1st and 2nd John, Revelation, and the Apocalypse of Peter, actually, weird, um, and even the Book of Wisdom of Solomon. But it does not contain Hebrews, James, or 1st and 2nd Peter. Hmm. I'll just give you some uh, other lists of people from the very beginning, okay? Um, so it does not, did not contain those two. But... In AD 200, the church father Caius provides the same list, but by AD 340, the church father Eusebius gives the list, uh, the list of canonical books of the New Testament that we accept today in all denominations. So we see that this was something that the church had to put together. It took them some time, lots of reading and comparing, reading and comparing, what fits, what doesn't, what is, does this actually work? <laughs> um, and so with this in mind, the question was never, and I want us to get this in this room, so if all that was just a lot of humble, like that's a lot of historical jargon that puts me to sleep. I don't care. So with that being in mind, the question was never, are these things outside the New Testament, things that should never be included at all? That wasn't the question. But rather, the doubt, the, 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 the question was, are there things in the New Testament that should be left out? They were being very careful of what they should include. That's what we see in history. So some doubted the inclusion of Hebrews. Some doubted the inclusion of Revelation. It's not the end of the world. We include them because we've compared them and we see how it all fits. Because, I mean, again, if you read Revelation for the first time and we've had decades to put pieces together of that book and people are still studying it today, trying to figure it all out, yep. right? So um, regardless, we should, if anything, we would have too many books, not too few. And so you need not worry about missing something. That's the point I'm making here. You don't need to worry about missing something. Am I missing a giant chunk? Oh my gosh, we don't have the Apocrypha books. Am I missing something? If anything else, we have too many, not too few. But the thing is, is that we see that these, ver these books were accepted by different people throughout the church in the early couple hundred years. Okay? Whew. All right. So the New Testament canon. Oh, I, I burned through all that. I apologize. All right. Cool. So what qualifies a book to be part of the canon? That's a good question, right? What qualifies the book. Protestants can say that the books must come from the apostolic circle, right? Either written by the apostles or by someone associated with the apostles. For example, Luke was not an apostle, but he was associated with the apostles. That's what, that's what the church eventually did. Like, okay, hold up. Who traveled with Jesus? Who was directly associated with these people? These people, these guys, cool. We'll accept that. And boom, now here we are. Now people have since questioned who's the author of the book of Hebrews. Some people say it's Paul. Some people say it's Peter. Some people say whatever. Point is, we get the idea that this does fit, right? So it is not that people picked and chose what canonical books, but rather that certain books impose themselves onto the church. That's important because I get told all the time by people who don't know anything about church history, oh, well, psh, you guys just chose those books because they fit your narrative. That's not what happened. Mm -hmm. That's just historically not true. So, um... Anyway, a lot of people just don't know. They just repeat what they've heard on the internet, okay? It's all true. Yes, I read on the internet. It's got to be true. Um, 
So the books of the church have historically been recognized as canonical books. They impose themselves onto the church, but the later uh, forgeries written centuries after have always been universally declined by the church. So it is not like as Dan Brown in the Da Vinci Code, some of you guys might remember that, uh, which presents the church as being some sort of conspiratorial alliance to destroy all the other gospels. This is, of course, a distortion of church history. Because there are, there is the Apocalypse of Peter. There's also the Gospel of Thomas. Mm -hmm. But these were written so far later that the church always rejected them because they were by what they called the Gnostics, right? The people who believe that everything here is evil and a whole other group. In fact, there's this book called Against Heresies by St. Arrhenius. And the entire book is, I read it last year during COVID and boy, that thing's dense, but it's a response to the Gnostics, the entire book. And it's to call them heretics. So that just doesn't fit together. So the later apocryphal books like Infancy Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Peter, and the Gospel of Philip all arose decades and even centuries after Jesus and therefore are dubious in their reliability. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, fun fact for you, the Gospel of Peter, instead of like a risen Christ, it literally has the cross like coming out of the, out of the tomb and like glowing and speaking to them like the cross itself. <laughs> I wonder why we question the historicity of it. Uh, <laughs> nothing to see here, folks. But let's do this. Because you guys know I like to end my lessons on an even if. Because I did this last week, right? Even if we can't, or maybe the Bible is with, I said this last week, right? It has an error in it. Does that mean we throw it all out? No, it just means we change our understanding of how God preserves scripture, right? That doesn't, you don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. If there's anything I've been saying during this whole time is that. But so let's play an even if game today. Okay. Even if you only accepted the earliest canon, this would merely mean you reject the book of Revelation and the book of Hebrews. Thus, no essential Christian doctrine would change. No Christian doctrine is solely taught in those books, nor uniquely depends on those books. Those books only bring further details. Because in all throughout the Gospels and other times, we know Jesus is coming back. Well, Revelation has that pretty clear but I don't need that to know that Jesus is coming back, yeah. right? The book of Hebrews, what is that? It's a Jewish book written to a Jewish audience about the risen Messiah. Well, I have the risen Messiah elsewhere. Now, granted, Hebrews brings more context of the Judaism of Jesus. It helps me understand that a little bit clearer, but do I need it to understand any, everything else? No, I still have the Trinity too in John 1. Yeah. We're okay. Okay, so these are these are just important things. Okay, they're just really important things. Um, so there is no harm in recognizing uh, Hebrews and Revelation, though, either, since they are in harmony with the others, and that's important. We want harmony amongst the books, not contention, right? Because the law of non-contradiction. You guys might remember that class we had. So they also bring clarity to things mentioned in other books. So finally. And I don't think I say this enough in here, so I wanted to make sure I mentioned this today. We also must not discount faith and the Holy Spirit. Because I'm in here, I'm always Mr. Like Brainiac guy, put on my glasses. I'm like, all right, guys, let me teach you some, some nerdy things, okay? And I give you all these details, and I get lost in the details. And some of you are like, this is so good. Other people are like, this is boring. <laughs> um, bottom line is, guys, we are a, we are a faith right? We are a religion to one degree or other, however you want to define that. And we must depend on the Holy Spirit. And if we look through church history, we see that God's hand was through this process. And I think we can take that in faith because we have enough other evidence to believe this stuff to be true. Okay. So I don't want to discount faith or the Holy Spirit in this class either. So I just want to make sure we're very clear on that. Of course, that's important. But right now I'm trying to answer some of these questions because how many of you guys learned something from this today? Yeah, it's kind of eye-opening. You're like, oh, wow, I didn't even think about that. That makes so much sense. And it helps give a bit more clarification on what happened throughout history. Because sometimes we are so far removed from that time period that we just haven't put it together yet. We haven't thought about some of these complicated things. And we never even knew that there was a source for half these things. But I remember when I dug, I started finding my, my faith less feeling like a faith and more like a firmer foundation than I ever had before. Because it was like, I can appeal to history. I have multiple sources I can pull from, from the second century. Are you kidding me? I don't just have to say the Bible said it. I believe it. That, and that's the end of it for me. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, that, there's nothing wrong with that because the Bible's true, but the more you dig, the more it just affirms. So this is extremely exciting for me. It's why I love doing what I, doing this class. Um, next week, this is the end, by the way. So next week, Brian will be here. He's going to go through the canon in more thorough detail. Um, he will mention uh, people, uh, other church people like Augustine. Maybe you guys have heard of Augustine or Augustine, if you're a snob. Um, <laughs> and uh, what? He was a snob. Yeah, you guys will find I'm not a fan of Augustine. I, there are certain things I, I agree with him on, but a lot of things I'm like, ugh. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's just the way I, I, way I roll. But anyway, it'll be helpful. Um, next week will be really important for you guys uh, just because I think Brian will help bring something new to the table here. And you guys will get to know somebody else who's very close to me who does this stuff all the time. So uh, any questions, comments, or insults? <laughs> I always like to open that up in there just in case I want somebody wants to like scream out a flaming heretic in the back. It's cool. Well, <laughs> the period where there wasn't really a whole lot of coming from hmm? God, when was that? Was that before Jesus died? Yes, that was before Jesus was even born. Okay. So it was between the Old and New Testament. It's about a period of about 400 years. Okay. Yeah. 400 years. We're talking about a lot well, of time that, here. That's the silent period. Right? Yep, the silent period, also known as the Dark Age. I didn't yeah. even know that was why. Yeah, because uh, yeah, because basically the word of God, the prophets had ceased. Yeah, but you're thinking of the Dark Ages around a thousand AD. Is what you're thinking? Yeah, you're probably thinking like yeah, you're probably thinking medieval Dark Ages. Yeah, the medieval Dark Ages. Yes. Was there ever that big of a gap before them as well? No. There was consistently always things. Yeah, the closest you probably have is the exile in Egypt. Yeah. That's probably the next closest, which is by because that was about 400 years that they were there too. Which, by the way, is a really cool parallel when you consider that. They were there for 400 years in captivity between the prophets and Christ. There's a 400 year period. And who sets us free? Jesus. After that 400 years, he is the Moses figure leading us out of Egypt, which is Satan, the world. So it is, dude, I'm telling you, when you start getting into this, the parallels just start blowing your mind. It's awesome. So anyway, uh, any other questions? I'm good with chatting, by the way. I've got no problem with that.